We take great pleasure in recognizing the achievements of our graduates, and since 2003, the Alumni Society has brought back dozens of notable alumni to speak to the SBA community about their work. This evening, we're honored to have designer and entrepreneur Deborah Adler as our speaker. Um, here to introduce Deborah, we are also honored to have Lita Tallarico. Lita is a co-founder and uh, is a co-founder and co-chair of uh, the School of Visual Arts MFA Design Program, and um, um, she lectures on design entrepreneurism around the world. She's also co-founded the M excuse me SBA Masters Workshop in Italy, an ongoing summer program. Lita has co-authored five books on design and entrepreneurship and is currently working on her sixth title, um, Design Entrepreneur Handbook. A founding associate of Bill Lacey Design, she's coordinated architect, uh, architect selection competitions and conferences for the Cleveland Museum of Art, National World Memorial um, War Mo to Memorial Design Competition, International Design Conference in Aspen, Italian Manifesto Conference, and the Pritzker Architecture Prize Annual Jury Meeting. She was the founding manager editor of American Illustration and Photography, a board member emeritus of Adobe Education Partners by Design, and member of AIGA Visionary Design Council. She was also a visiting scholar at the American Academy in Rome in 2008 and 2010, where she conducted extensive research on the Roman letter. Please join me in welcoming Lita to the podium. I'm very, very, very happy to be here this evening because for whatever it is that I've done for the past 16 years, I've been here at SVA with this MFA design program. And Deborah Adler was one of our students in the program from 2001 and 2002. During that time, she took on a thesis project that was monumental. Her objective was to redesign the prescription medicine labeling system and container. It was a momentous decision for Deborah because what began as a very challenging thesis turned into a path that would drive Deborah's future career as a designer. While working on Safe RX, which is what her thesis was called at the time, Deborah had the conviction that she could actually change what was an entrenched and tragically flawed system. But she wasn't sure who was going to be willing to make the leap with her. Was it going to be the FDA or the Pharmacists Association or the government? She remained undaunted. She adjusted her pitch and presentation to accommodate all and any of the above. Deborah knew that it wouldn't happen immediately, and realistically, she allowed herself four years to get it off the ground. As it turned out, it happened much sooner with much networking and determination. In fact, I remember Deborah taking a trip to Washington, D.C. to meet with an organization before school had even finished but she sold her concept to a major corporation. The rest is history. Not only did she transform her thesis into ClearRx, she became a design consultant to Target, the client, was featured in a, con in a commercial that aired during the Super Bowl, certainly the first time I ever saw a graphic designer in a television commercial, was given an unprecedented solo exhibition at the SVA gallery, as well as winning almost every major design award that year. And if that wasn't enough, the bottle became part of the Museum of Modern Art's permanent collection. And then, within a very short period of time, this prescription medicine bottle became a graphic design icon. Since then, we've watched Deborah from the sidelines, as we do with all of our MFA design alums. We saw her set up shop and collaborate with Milton Glaser, witnessed her becoming a mom and molding her career so that she could not only do both, but also turn the inspiration she received from her children into her work. 
Deborah is an award-winning award designer who is widely recognized at, as someone who makes a difference in this very competitive landscape. Her goal is to make people's lives safer, but her belief is that it doesn't have to compromise the design. It's a well-known fact that good design is good for business, but according to Deborah, it can also make lives better and safer. And she has started her own business venture to do just that. So it's with great joy that I introduce Deborah Adler. Thank you so much, Lita. That was very nice. And thank you, SVA. And thanks to everyone here for making it out tonight. I really feel honored and humbled at the prospect of being able to um, give a talk to, to a school and to teachers and people that have taught me so much. Um, so I brought a few things from my student days here to help tell my story. Um, a length of silicone tubing, some dollhouse materials, a card, a bottle of pills, my story is about little things that become big things because they touch people. This is where I learned that design can do more than delight people, but that it can solve problems and change behavior. This is where I learned that design can change outcomes. My first connection to SVA was a continuing education class with Milton Glaser, night school. I had been working at a small studio not far from here, and the owner was also an SVA grad. Um, I loved working there, and I was really, really, really good at the computer programs. Photoshop, freehand was very popular at the time, Illustrator. But the more I worked, the more I start to begin, I began to feel the weight of all the things that I really didn't know. Design history, typography, it was a long list. I realized that I really lacked the context and the education to be a true designer, so I signed up for that night class with Milton Glaser. How lucky was that? That class led to others, and I continued to work at the studio just down the street until Steve Heller and Lita Tallarico, who just spoke, um, finally let me into the MFA program. I, I didn't know it then, um, but that was really a defining moment in my life. Whole worlds opened up for me. I was inspired by my teachers, and I was also inspired by the other students. Um, I remember I used to flip through the thesis books from the previous year. Um, this one woman, Hiju Choi, she designed um, a system for labeling clothing and other items um, for people who were blind, so that people could know what color shirt that they were grabbing. Um, another, another man, um, Kevin Park, designed a signage system to make it easier for people to, uh, sorry, for pilots to land planes. Um, he came up with a whole new system for the airport signage. Deborah Adler, she was planning her thesis on, are you ready? Curly hair. I was going to create a curly hair mecca. Um, with all different types of products um, for different ethnicities, for different cultures, for different curl types. Back in 2001, there really wasn't much um, out there in the world to make you know, the world safe for curls. Um, but then on September 11th, the towers fell, and suddenly my curly hair idea did not seem important to me anymore. A few months earlier, my grandmother had taken my grandfather's medication by mistake. Her name was Helen, and his name was Herman. Um, the same initials, H. Adler, and their packaging looked practically identical. Here she was, a Holocaust survivor, in danger again from a stupid mix-up. Um, as a designer, I realized that I knew things about people that the pharmacy industry was missing. I could fix this. What I learned solving that problem so that it wouldn't happen again is the idea that I'd like to pass on to you today. And that is, if you want to change the world, go to the Gemba. 
Gemba is a Japanese term, and it translates as the real place, the place where the work is done. For a Tokyo reporter, the Gemba might be the scene of a crime. For a surgeon, it might be the operating room. For a drug company, the Gemba is the lab where they're making the drugs. But for the people who have to take the medication, like my grandmother, this was the Gemba. This is her medicine cabinet. This is where we see what really happens and what really needs changing. It's where we can discover the little things that turn in to be the big things. That pill mix-up could have happened to anyone, someone in their 20s or 30s, and it could have had a much more dire outcome had my grandparents been on different types of medication. Um, so I was scared for my grandparents, of course, but I was also intrigued. At the time, I was you know, trying to come up with an idea for my thesis, so I dug a little bit deeper. This is Sarah. She suffered from high blood pressure and was prescribed a low dose of um, cardism to, con to control it. Because Sarah felt that the capsule was too large to swallow whole, she chewed her medication. She became prog progressively weaker and she died three weeks later. This was her medication. Unfortunately, she missed the words, I see everyone's head turning to the side. Um, she missed the words on the side of the bottle warning her that the tablet must be swallowed whole, not to chew or crush. This is Henry. Henry suffered from rheumatoid arthritis and was prescribed a, a low dose of oral methotrexate. And it killed him after he misread the instructions on the label and took one tablet every morning instead of every Monday. This was his medication. I was shocked to learn that 60% of Americans don't take their medication correctly. So I started looking at the bottles and really digging into it. And some warnings are printed on wraparound bottles that don't quite fit the bottle, so directions are misaligned. The first thing you'll notice is that you have to turn the bottle in a full circle to read all that information. You have orange warning labels on orange bottles, which often don't work because you can't even see it. It, can play, it, it creates information camouflage. Um, sometimes you'll have black text on dark colored backgrounds, also making it difficult to notice, much less see. The ones that do have a lot of contrast, like take with food or do not take with nitrates, that's an improvement, but what is a nitrate anyway? And consider those icons. That one on the top right corner looks to me a lot like a gas tank or someone sitting. Typically, the only prominent information is the pharmacy logo. The patient instructions, take one tablet daily, looks like it's part of the patient's home address. And consider that number in the left-hand corner, 10. Is that 10 milligrams, 10 pills, 10 times a day? Who knows? There's also no hierarchy of information, which means something very important, like the name of the drug, in this case, Leviquin, ends up at the bottom of the label. You see it there? It could easily be missed. It could be confused for a generic name or a manufacturer's name. Most labels are really disorganized. So how does a patient who might be a little disorganized, him or herself, know what's important? My goal was to give them more clarity. In the Gemba, I learned that those longer, more detailed sheets of paper that are stapled to the bag um, are of no help either. What happens when you get home? They go in the trash, 9.9 9 .9 times out of 10. And on the rare occasion that it's not thrown in the trash, this is what you're left with. Tedious lines of text that are really hard to read and difficult on the eye. As designers, we know that your eyes get tired after reading about 10 to 11 words per line. That's why books are set the way that they are. For an even faster read, we have newspapers set in columns. This is twice the average line length at about 23 words per line. Um, there's letting issues, kerning issues. It's no wonder that a designer wants to dig their teeth into that. So the solution that came from this Gemba um, changed the way 1,500 target pharmacies package and dispense their medication. I'm going to have Brian Williams tell you about it. It's among the most heavily used and frequently cursed items in the American household, especially among older Americans, the prescription bottle. It is not perfect, and like a lot of things, it took a little thought, and tonight it has been improved. We get the story tonight from NBC's Robert Bazell.
It is a new bottle for prescription drugs designed to enhance safety. The first new design since the familiar plastic bottles that have been around for 50 years. I take a lot of pills. I don't even count them. Helen Adler made a mistake that led to the new design. She got sick from taking her husband's medication. And start to take my pill, I took his pill. I'm a little lady. You're a little Come lady. You, uh, you're so tall and I'm so little. When Helen's granddaughter, Deborah learned about the incident, she set out to bring a change. As a graphic designer, she realized pill bottles could be much more user friendly. At the end of the day, the responsibility for how to take your medicine falls on you. You bring home your medicine and you have no other contact with doctors or pharmacists. So overall, the bottle and the label is your only form of communication. This is well, the toughest one to finish all this medication. Yeah. Deborah Adler, who now works for the Milton Glaser I design firm, through. came up with several ideas until she developed the new design, which she sold to the Target Corporation. The new bottles have color-coded bands for every member of the family. Grandma's bottles, for instance, could be coded green. And the name and instructions are written on a flat surface instead of wrapped around a tiny bottle. And special instructions are inserted in a card instead of written on a piece of paper that's often thrown away. Target is using the new bottle starting this month. And health experts hope other companies will adopt similar designs. And I think that's going to really relieve people's level of stress. And they're going to feel more confident and secure when they're taking their medication. The hope is that people like Helen Adler can easily see they are taking the right drug in the right dose at the right time. Grandma, I got you these flowers. This Thank is for you. all of us. Robert Bazell, NBC News, New York. I hate that scene with the flowers at the end. It's like seen so posed, but um, this was a humongous collaboration, of course. It took not a city, but a village to make Clarex come to life. Target marketing, operations, technicians. I worked with an industrial designer to develop the final shape of the bottle. Um, it was amazing to see that something that started as a school project suddenly other people can take ownership of, and rightfully so, because if it wasn't for everyone's hard work, it never would have um, come to life. Everyone was also very excited by the commercial. We say something new, we say something new. Smarter, easier to read pharmacy system. Clear RX from Target, a revolution in pharmacy. We had a lot of fun, my grandma and I. She, you know, we were an ad. She became the mayor of her town pretty much from this. Um, Clear RX got a lot of accolades, accolades but um, what was happening outside was more important. We were increasing regulation at the local, state, and national level. The California State Board of Pharmacy passed a bill requiring labeling changes. The Texas Board of Pharmacy was following suit. The National Association of Boards of Pharmacy approved the California bill. And the FDA is always now seeking labeling solutions to better communicate patient um, safety and RX risks. And equally as important, um, this project really got me interested in a lot of other problems that the healthcare world is facing. And it's given me the opportunity to work with a lot of innovators like Target, Johnson & Johnson, and Medline on projects which ultimately will touch all of us. How many of you have ever been hospitalized? Hopefully not too many. No one goes to the hospital to get sick, but a lot of people do. Nearly 100,000 people died last year from infections that they got in the hospital. And the top cause of that infection is catheters. And the Gemba for catheterization is the patient's bedside, where there's you, your nurse, and the catheter. You're not looking forward to it. The nurse is not looking forward to it. But the catheter, the catheter is very excited. It wants to jump around and flail about and fall right off that sterile field, which is how it picks up a lot of the germs that can cause the infection. The typical Foley catheter system comes in a box with two layers. The top layer has a tray with all the tools and utensils you need. 
And underneath is the actual catheter wound up tight in, in, a, in a box. Um, I think it's very hard to keep this catheter contained inside those four walls of the box and in such tight quarters, which was a big part of the problem that I was noticing. Um, so our goal was to make this a calmer experience and a more sterile experience. So we designed a one-layer system that simplifies the steps and keeps that catheter from going wild. We included a stop and check protocol um, as part of that top label so it's not missed. Um, we're hoping that people will become part of the protocol and they can, a, a nurse can make sure that they document that there is a clinical reason, a valid clinical reason for the insertion and um, to check each box upon completion. The outside label opens up into a book booklet with step-by-step -step instructions and it's a two minute course in wound care so that nurses can review before entering the room. It also allows them to walk patients through the process um, that's about to happen if that patient wants to know. Some people might not want to know, some people might want to know. Um, now there are not only fewer infections, but nurses, nurses and patients feel a lot better about the experience itself. Going to the Gemba really gives you the eyes to see all the steps that go into the larger, larger action, like figuring out how much and which medication to take, or inserting a catheter correctly and keeping it sterile. But the other ingredient you need is empathy. Don't create for the world, create for the person. We have to understand who touches, who, sorry, we have to understand who touches and who is touched. And every step along the way, put ourselves in the person's shoes. What would we do if we were she? How would we feel? What would we need next? After graduating the School of Visual Arts, I had the very good fortune of going to work with Milton Glaser for five years. And um, he, he taught me a lot there, but one of the biggest things he taught me was that some of a designer's most valuable moments are in that uncomfortable state when we haven't quite solved the problem. It's when the pieces of the puzzle aren't fitting together that we're most fertile. And if we're wise, we'll learn to be as comfortable as we can in that uneasy state because um, you'll learn a lot more about the problem the longer, you'll learn a lot more about the solution the longer you stay in that zone. Here's an example. When we took our catheter solution back into the Gemba, we discovered that the one layer tray was a huge success, but that the patient education and the instructions for use really was not evident. The nurse had so much going on that everything just sort of got lumped together and wound up in the trash. The information was dreary, and there wasn't enough, um, enough to sort of pull the nurses in, so they just thought that it was trash. Um, that wasn't just waste. We saw that as a wasted opportunity. So we, trans we transformed the patient information into something that was forbidding into something more welcome. Um, we designed a Hallmark-type card that, patients can, that nurses can give to their patients. The cards are cheerful and inspiring. We hired one of our favorite illustrators, Rodico Prado, to illustrate um, the flowers. We picked a very heavy, uncoated, toothy cardstock. We set the type just perfectly, and then we placed it in the most unexpected of places, right underneath the top flap of a Foley catheter tray. The nurse can't miss it, and suddenly, when he or she opens the pack, they, just by the touch alone, just by feeling it, they say, this doesn't belong to me. Um, and they want to give it to the patient, and it's a nice interaction that happens. So the nurses love the cards, but they're also a big um, hit with the patients who like to keep them by their bedside. And as one nurse manager told me, um, the cards accidentally engage the family members as well. Because, you know, we're all so nosy. What's the first thing you do when you go into a hospital room to visit a loved one? You read the cards that, you, that are on the, the bedside. Um, the results are also good. Oops. Um, there was a decrease of 83% reduction in catheter-associated associate, urinary tract infections over a two-year period. And um, the catheter days went from 1,209 to 925 over that same period. So there was a reduction of people 
how long the catheter has, has stayed in. in. Um, that's from one health center um, in Georgia. The Joint Commission highlighted Medline's work as a best practice, and it also got some nice attention from exciting pharmaceutical medical packaging news. It's a little thing that turns out to be a big thing. Everyone feels better because we kept going back into the Gemba and we didn't rush to find a solution. Sometimes the Gemba isn't where we think it is. For example, if we want to solve the problem of educating girls in rural Africa, the Gemba is not the school, it's the well. Girls spend hours fetching water every single day. Their families can't afford to even have them in school until they solve this water problem. Or take poverty in India. There are 400 million people who live entirely outside of the system in India. They can't put money into the bank or take out a loan. They can't get a driver's license or register to vote or get assistance from the government at all. 400 million people. How in the world do you fix something like that? You start by giving this man here a way to prove who he is, and then multiply that by 400 million. Sharon has no birth certificate, no identification of any kind other than his own say-so. Now, the Adhar project is using biometrics to identify everyone. They've been at it for three years, and now there are 275 million people who can finally prove who they are who can finally tap into the system. The Adhar project is changing what's possible for a nation, one person at a time. I know these examples seem pretty far removed from visual arts, but they are emblematic of something we learn here. Design thinking is knowing where to look to find the problems that need solving, and knowing how to look to understand what we see. At SVA, one of the ways that we apply our understanding is through craft. That's where we learn, that's where I learned, to this is where I learned to make things and make them come to life. Um, and I've built my studio around that. I remember, ma I remember making my little prototypes um, at Kevin O'Callaghan's workshop just down the road on the other side of town. Does anyone here have Kevin O'Callaghan? I can't see anyway, so. Um, <laughs> Kevin has a genius for getting people to make things. He taught me, and I'm sure a lot of people, that a great idea is really just smoke until you can put your hands on it and make it real. Um, this is an example of one of the projects he had us do for Moon Men for the MTV Music Awards. He gave all of us a Moon Men, moon men and asked us to do something with it. Pretty open. So I ended up making high heels with the MTV buckles. So they were walking, moon men. Um, but I would stay up all night rigging plexi tubing. I even I found some remnants from the days. Plexi tubing and dollhouse materials. Um, anything that I could do to make a convincing imitation of a new kind of pill bottle. Um, I'm not an industrial designer, so I used what I could to get the idea across. Yeah, SVA is definitely where we learn to make things. And what I'm trying to get across now is that our craft that we learn can really transcend the visual. What we learn here is the process of solving, but what we actually produce is change. We even got the opportunity, as Lita me mentioned, to put on a huge exhibition at the, at the SVA gallery here to tell the whole story. And, and Kevin helped as well as um, Dorothy Globus in putting together um, humongous life-size, bigger-than-life bottles um, that tell the story of the transition of this thesis project. The things we touch, the things we make, touch lives and change behavior. You can see the transition. Well, here's another story about changing behavior. 
not long ago, some of my work was involved um, in a study on wound care dressings in hospitals. And in this study, each nurse was given a state-of-the-art dressing and asked to apply it to a wound model. Um, the kits all came with instructions for use, but not one nurse applied this dressing correctly. Um, they were all, um, none of them were wound care specialists because I think 70% of the time it's bedside um, nurses that apply the wound dressings. And here were 68 professionals that were batting zero. The good news is, is that that was the control group. In the test group, nearly nine out of 10 nurses did the job perfectly. I'm pretty sure you'd want the one that worked perfectly, but it was actually the same dressing, but with just a huge improvement in care. All we did was change the packaging and the labeling to change how people actually used the product. This study was published in a woundostomy um, journal, and it's got a lot of uh, um, attention because it, it really improved compliance by 88%. We didn't solve for the world, we solved for the person, in this case the nurse, and that made all the difference. And that's something that you can only learn in the Gemba. It's by watching. And it's by caring. Care is what people do or don't do. And to me, that's what design is about. It's thinking about the places where the work is done and making those places our desks. It's thinking about the, the people who do the work and being, them with, being there with them every step of the way when they do it. Lately, my Gemba has been hospital operating suites. This is the most complex working environment on earth. Every issue the hospital deals with comes together here. Education, communication, transportation, technology, safety, and waste. Waste isn't just about what goes in the trash or what's not essential, but waste is the cost of things that are not done right. So we talk to scrub techs and material managers as well as circulating nurses and OR directors and physicians. I'm lucky enough to have a surgeon for a father. Almost like anthropo anthropologists, we learn the rhythms and the cultures of all the different departments, discovering every day the little things that we can do better. Here's one of those little things, the surgical procedure tray. It's a pack that can contains all of the essentials that you need um, to perform an operation. There's a different tray for every procedure, but they all basically look alike. They're all big and bulky and blue. A big blue wall and central sterile supply. It's not obvious which is which. Oftentimes, the scrub tech will pull the wrong one, um, and there goes a $500 or $1,000 um, kit that can't go into the OR. It's supposed to be latex-free and it has latex in it. One little thing and poofed. This is an environment where you have to have speed and you have to have exactitude and you can't trade one for the other. Um, you've never been, well, m many of you probably have never been to central sterile supply rooms, I'm sure. But I'm sure that you can picture and see this big blue wall of same looking trays filled with life or death, death instruments, and I'll bet you can see what the problem is and that you know how to solve it. Because SVA has really prepared you to see problems like this one. Seeing is solving. And here are some results from this. It has improved the packaging of the surgical procedure trays has improved setup times, 48 minutes per procedure. It's reduced inventory by 10 to 14%. It's increased staff pro productivity, improved cast capture, and increased space utilization. In a sort of bookend project, my team and I are also now designing kits that make it a little better for the patients who are actually getting the procedures. Um, for any of you who have actually had to have an operation or surgery, um, you know how intimidating and, and very stressful it can, it can be during the days that lead up to it. Um, and you get all sorts of 
information like this before you have the surgery. You can't eat the night before. You have to wash the surgery site three days before in a certain way, and then two days before, and then the morning of. Everything has to be done just so you have to get to the, to the surgery at a certain time. And if one thing goes wrong, um, the surgery can get delayed or postponed, and that is adds to the stress level, and it also um, adds to the hospital's cost, and there's a lot of issues that go along with that. Um, so we're in the process of building a series of kits that patients will be able to get online um, that organizes what they need and when they need it before their procedures. Um, the kits hopefully will cover all the steps in a warm and easy to understand way. So the patients will be ready to go and hopefully a little less stressed. Here are some pictures of my team and I um, building the prototypes in my studio. This is Kevin O'Callaghan's class all over again. We're making things, we're making things, seeing how they work, bringing them into the Gemba, and trying to make them better. By the way, the Gemba is so important that I have to go there even when I'm nine months pregnant. <laughs> And now we're in the kit business. We're also making kits um, that will help people sleep better in the hospital, hopefully, and ha have it be a more quiet experience for them. We're hoping that it'll really increase the experience, the patient experience and the patient journey when they go into their um, hospital rooms to get um, a kit that will help occupy their mind and help them get a more restful sleep um, in a pack even just the package alone is designed like a pillow um, so that hopefully it will send a message that the hospital cares. We're also designing kits for during the day. They can refresh and relax. and one for new mothers and their babies to take some of the uncertainty and the stress out of doing important things right the very first time. One of the marvelous things about the School of Visual Arts is that when you leave, you do not leave your mentors behind. They become your colleagues. Brian Collins, who's a designer and a colleague and who was a teacher at S in, in the SVA MFA program, um, likes to say, the personal is the universal. My grandmother's medicine cabinet is really millions of people's medicine cabinets. That overexcited catheter is the vector for millions of hospital-acquired infections. What that nurse reaches for next tells the story of how wound care can go better for millions of patients. In the Gemba, you learn that there is no best way. There is always a better way. But the trick is to be there to see it. Go to the real place where the work is done. Watch, ask, solve at human scale. The little things are the big things. Thank you. <laughs>